Okay, so I've got a floor plan coming together here in Revit, and now I'm going to take that into Photoshop to render it. Uh, so you'll see, if I go to Realistic, I do have a, uh, a floorboard texture there, but I don't even want to use that. I want to do all the rendering in Photoshop. It's probably a better approach generally with plans, mm -hmm. even though you can get some of the rendering out of Revit, definitely, and you can even do 3D rendering out of Revit of plans. Uh, which we'll um, maybe come to you later, but, um, but for now I just want to get the line work from Revit and, uh, and then again set up all the rendering in Photoshop as a first step. So the first thing, just to go through a few Revit things, is um, it's really helpful to have a view set up just to export. So I'm going to duplicate my level 1 floor plan and I'll actually just choose duplicate here, not duplicate with detailing. Because if you choose duplicate with detailing, it'll copy text and dimensions and other things that are really overlays in this view, and I don't want those things. So I'm just going to choose duplicate. So I've got a copy of that floor plan, and I'll rename it and call it uh, level one. Uh, let's call it what it is Photoshop. Okay, and then basically I'm going to hide the things I don't want to see here. So I'm going to hide those reference planes. Just hide the category. Um, I don't want to see all of the sections, but maybe I'm going to keep this one just as an example. So I'll hide the other sections by element. Okay, because I can't hide by category, of course. So I don't want to hide all of them. And then this one, it's looking a bit technical. Right, so great for technical drawings, but on a presentation uh, type drawing, you don't really want to see that sort of drawing reference. Uh, you want it to be a bit more stylized and simpler. So I'm just going to cycle through there to get at least the L, and then maybe in Photoshop we'd change that to something else. Or you could even turn it off and then just draw the arrow uh, over the top in Photoshop. But I think I'll just keep the L and um, have that on both ends. And I can tweak that a bit more in Photoshop. And I'll break it in the middle again just so that I've got the line on each end, something like that. Uh, and so then the final thing is I've got the um, level below coming through because of the underlay setting. So looking in the plan view properties, you'll see underlay, which I'm sure most of you have started to look at, and we can change the first option there to none, which simply uh, disables all the other options, and that will just turn it off, essentially. So that's the basic setup. I want to bring that into Photoshop. And uh, it's important you understand that it needs to be hit in line if you want a, uh, a vector drawing in Photoshop. If you set it to shaded, and it's got some shading, even just shaded, but especially if you use realistic, that's essentially going to be pixel-based or a raster image when you export it. So by keeping it either hidden line or wireframe, wireframe's probably not that useful, but hidden line is what we want. Um, again, when you export it, that will be vectors if you do it in the right way. So I'm going to uh, save my file of course. And so we've got two choices when we export it. You can either export from the view, and I'm saying export, what I'm really going to do is print to a file. So don't make the mistake of choosing export from the menu. That's a common mistake and it's understandable but that's not the right way. So print to a file and I can print from this view or I can set it up on a sheet which is helpful because then it'll have a page size and a location. If you just print your view, it's not clear uh, where the view starts. You can control it, but it's again easier if you've got a sheet. So I'm going to make a new sheet, clicking on Sheets All, right clicking and then New Sheet. And then I'll go to Load just to show you again where all of the custom title blocks that I've made are on the P drive. Um, in the Revit library folder there. When you go to title blocks you'll see lots of title blocks set up just for this purpose with either very minimal uh, title information or even better, nothing at all. So for presentation graphics you don't want that technical looking type of title block, you just want something nice and clean. And so I'll try A3 metric blank. Don't worry that it says uh, portrait for some of these. If it says landscape in the name, it is landscape. Oh, this one is landscape at the end anyway. So A3 metric blank landscape. 
So that gives us a size that we can relate to. And then coming back to the um, plan that I've just made, I can now drag that onto the sheet and you can see then how big that plan is going to be at 1 to 100 on an A3 page, which is a really helpful thing, especially when you're thinking about how that's going to work in your larger layout. So your layout might be A2, or you would have been given a page size by now. For your final A1. A1, okay, perfect. So uh, this is where the metric system is brilliant because A3 fits uh, exactly, you'll fit four A3s into an A1. Right, so A2 is double A3, and then A1 is double A2. So four A3s give you an A1. So we can already tell this plan is going to fit into a quarter of an A1 page. And uh, again, that gives us a bit of a handle on the size. And But again, really importantly, when we go into Photoshop, this now has a border or a page size that will help to relocate it later when we want to uh, update the render. So you're going to, I'm sure, keep working on your design. And when you want to bring that floor plan in, by having a page, it's got a location, and then you can just bring your new floor plan in, and it'll be in exactly the same place in Photoshop. So I've got that viewport selected, and I'm just going to change it over here in properties to no title, because we don't want that ugly um, technical title block. And I've got a nice clean plan uh, with a size. Uh, I'll just show you maybe if you want to have, uh, have a go at testing some different page sizes. You might not want A3. You can select the border, go to edit type, and load, and that's how you change the page size. So make sure you don't delete that frame or the page border. That can be difficult to get back from. So again, leave it there, but then when you select it, you can go to edit type, load, and then change to a different page size and see if that works. So there's a four metric blank. And this is one where I think I've got yeah, portrait still in the name, but I think it is uh, actually landscape. Yep, there we are. And it might just fit, but that's pretty squishy, so it's not quite right. At 1 to 100, we're not really going to make it um, on A4. Not a problem. I can select that border, and then eas easily over here, just change that back to um, A3. And centre it. Okay, so that's, uh, that's in the right place. And so again, I'll save it, because this is when things can crash. Um, and then on the file menu, go to print, and print again, or over here, just click where it says print on the menu, and that does the same thing. And really important you understand that we're printing to a file. And if you've got the Creative Cloud, you'll probably all have this Adobe P uh, PDF program on your computer in your list of printers. If you've got a Windows computer, you're going to have Microsoft Print to PDF as well, which is the free Microsoft one. To be honest, they're both rubbish. Um, the Adobe one's slightly better than the Microsoft one. The Microsoft one, um, it's necessary occasionally if the Adobe one isn't working, you have to use the Microsoft one in here. But it only goes to A3. So that's why I say it's not very good. A3 is the biggest page size you can do. So worst case, we can use that one, but it's it's pretty buggy. So often you'll see when you're using it, it'll disable all these buttons and you've got to go out and then come back in to make it work. The Adobe one's better, but it's got memory issues. So when you have uh, lots of programs open on your computer, or if you're on a computer without much RAM, it'll often just stop working halfway through. In here though, it tends to work pretty well because these computers have a bit of RAM. But on your own computers, I highly recommend that you try some of the free PDF creating programs, and there are dozens of them. So I'll just quickly tell you a couple. Would any of you know some free PDF printers? Ah. Which ones did you try? Okay, I'll give you a few. The one I recommended? Oh, okay. Well, sure, yeah, okay. So Qt is a good one. Qt PDF. Yep, Qt. They've been around for years. They make up lots of other good free programs. Um, so they're pretty good. And then um, the one I really like is called Primo PDF because it's, yeah. So it's pretty good, but um, I think you've got to activate it or something to get it working the first go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are online ones, but they're not going to work this way. Um, 
So yeah, so Primo is good. There's a there's a um, bigger company that make Primo. It's called Nitro, I think. Um, and uh, anyhow, so Nitro is brilliant. I've got it, but um, but Primo is still great and completely free. And I've never had a problem with it. Uh, been using it for years, and uh, it gives you options the Adobe One doesn't have, and it's free. So we can't install that on these computers. We've got security issues, um, and IT have to, you know, check all of that. So it's hard for us to install free programs on these computers. But you can do that easily on your own computers. And uh, okay, so yeah, the Adobe One though most of the time is fine. So it's good to think of it though still as a virtual printer. So the way you set it up is just like a printer. Uh, you can go to properties, and you'll see printer type settings, like the page size, and uh, that's helpful to understand it. But you often don't even need to adjust it here, because I'll show you the better option. You should always look at this anyway, down the bottom. You can definitely go to properties for certain things, but you should always go to setup when you're printing anything from Revit. Just, it should be in, uh, instinct after a little while. So when you click setup there, I'll just see, I'm sure some of you will know this straight away because a lot of you have been doing this for years. What's the most important setting? Exactly. Zoom 100%. It's really annoying. I mean, I know why they've got that fit to page as the default. It's so the people who don't know, when they go, go to print the first time, they're going to get something on their page. It'll scale whatever you've got and fit it onto whatever page you're printing on. So that's why it's the default. But we're doing, you know, trying to do professional work and we want to print to scale. So zoom 100% should be what you choose every single time, um, unless you're trying to do a reduce, reduce set of drawings or something, which you probably won't be doing for a while anyway. So zoom 100%, that should just be automatic. Choose that. And then you should also think about your page size. So here we'll choose A3, because that's what the title block is. And then the only other option is whether you want it to be centered or offset from the corner. It doesn't make much of a difference here anyway, but just choose one of those settings and stick with it. So I, I'm going to stick with offset from corner. And try not to change these other settings, especially leave that option on vector processing, that's really important. And the quality only uh, factors in when you're doing raster anyway, but you can leave that on high and that's fine. Uh, so that's it. But yeah, most important again, zoom 100% and the page size, click OK. And then even though I know it's right, out of habit, I still click preview pretty much every time just to be doubly sure. Oh, previewing. Oh, right. Right, okay, yeah, so that tells you it probably is a memory issue. Yeah, yeah. So I've, I've written a huge thing to Adobe about this and they still haven't responded. Yeah, yeah. Oh, God, you should, I've got a bit of a reputation apparently for being a bit of a... Well, but I do, they ask me, I mean, not Adobe, but Autodesk, because um, I've written things to them as well. They've come back to me and asked me to review things for them because of all the complaining I've done. So, <laughs> it's not too bad. Yep. Um, yeah, so, that's all set up. And if I click OK, then it'll ask me again where I want the file to go. So, if you notice, I didn't worry about picking back uh, in that previous dialogue where the file is and what the name is because it asks you again. And I'll choose then the folder that I'm saving in and give it a name. So Myrtle Street uh, proposed uh, level one plan. Loop. Okay, so it's made a PDF file. Uh, we don't need to do anything with it in Acrobat, so I'm going to close that and then go over to Photoshop and then open. File open and find that same file. There we are. Okay, so really important that you realise Photoshop is a raster editing program. It's got a few tools for vectors, but primarily it's for raster. And raster, if you're not sure, means pixels. So when you open a vector based image like this in Photoshop, it will rasterize it. So it turns the straight lines into pixels, and it has a resolution, which tells you that is 
rasterizing it. And uh, normally you can just leave it on the default. You just need to be aware of those settings and realize 300 dpi is the standard for printing. It has been for a while. So always try and do 300 dpi. So Exactly, that, that's the one option to think about. That's right, that's really good. So yeah, so bounding box will crop it back to the area of the objects in that view. Media box will give us the page. And that's really good if we want to locate it in exactly the same place every time. So media box is a good option if you've got a page set up in Photoshop, oh, sorry, in uh, Revit like I have. And, uh, and then the other one to check, this time uh, it's okay, but sometimes you'll see it'll flick back to grayscale if you're opening up a black and white uh, drawing. And even if it's, uh, it is black and white, you should change that to RGB color because you're gonna add color to it. And that's the mode for the whole file. So check that, it's still on RGB. Does anyone know about using CMYK? Exactly, that's the way you should be thinking about it. So later you can change it to CMYK, but you're probably better off starting with RGB. Uh, but think about that, because if you understand those two things, you're going a long way to understanding how colour really works in the real world. Uh, but yeah, RGB to start with, but think about when you need CMYK as well, that's good. So there we are, so I've got my um, plan imported. You can see it's coming pretty well, um, with the cutouts that I want mostly, except this does happen. I wish it didn't, but uh, AutoCAD doesn't do this, but Revit occasionally, when you set hatch patterns, will put a, uh, a background onto those. It's all to do with the, um, the setup in Revit, with that material. And you can go and disable it and then print it again, but I'll show you a quick uh, shortcut you can use to make it transparent, because I want to render that floor. And I want it cut out just like the, um, the furniture is. So you want that checkerboard. The checkerboard tells you it's transparent. So how do we get all that white stuff? Well, easy way is to use the, um, I can show you the real way with channels, but that's a bit harder. So I'll just show you with the eyedropper, uh, sorry, with the magic wand. Um, if you turn contiguous off, and here we don't even need to really change the tolerance. Sometimes we need to adjust the tolerance, but here it's black and white. So if I select the white, it should go zooming in pretty clearly around, oh no, sorry, it's not, you can see there, because it's been rasterized, yeah, it's got some grey. So I'm going to change the tolerance right down to about 5, and then try again. That's still not good enough, I do want to keep the lines, and uh, yeah, it's a bit of a shame actually when it does like this. So maybe I will show you with the channels. Wish it hadn't done this actually, but... Oh no, I'll live with it. So, so that's good enough. I'm getting fussy. Um, so there, again, we're going to lose some of the detail, but um, I think it's, it's good enough. Okay, so that's uh, all selected, and then uh, delete, and that's going to clear out all of the white. So I've got left now just the dark line work, and you can beef that up if you go to um, invert the selection, select inverse. Oh, now what's happened here? Just make sure it's going around. Oh, yes, that's okay. So it's, uh, yep. So select inverse, and then you can use um, things like levels to beef up the, um, the line work there. So, let's see if that's, actually it's got to come down there. I don't know. So, I don't want to think about this, but yeah, that's, not going to be my friend because it's already uh, see-through, but uh, anyway, if you do that a few times, you'll get it to beef up. Otherwise, you could just fill it, but you'd have to get all of the pixels. So rather than using this method, I'll use another trick, which is to right-click on the um, thumbnail there and then select pixels. So that will select every bit that has a colour, every pixel that has a colour value, and then you could just fill it with, uh, with black. And that's going to give you stronger line work. Um, anyway, that's good enough as it is. So I've got all the lines there. And then now I'll um, deselect and then make uh, a couple of new layers. 
layer 1 is the layer with the line work on it, so I'll rename that and call it line work. Oops. Drag it to the top because we want the rendering to go under this. So I'll now show you why it's so good to have a, um, a cutout um, drawing with the line work cut out with everything inside it transparent because now I can just then select with the um, best selection tool which is polygonal. I know magic one's probably the funnest one at first but ah what's going on there sorry that's a little bit weird. Oh, God, I hate when this happens. Sorry I'll just see if I can ah oh, <coughs> sorry that's just going up to the whole screen. Move it. So it's just uh, windowed in an unusual way. I can still go, but um, uh, so oh, close it. Well, that's going to close the file. Um, so uh, so annoying when this happens. It's only the programs that were set up for Apple first, like most of the Adobe programs that do this. Uh, Uh, yeah, yeah, so Windows, uh, let's see, Windows D, and yeah, I have minimised it, and then, yeah, it's just, uh, there's a way, so I'm just being a bit stupid, so this one, no, uh, so no. it's because I can't get back to the, um, maybe I'll close it and open it again, maybe that'll solve it, so I'll close, and I'm going to say yes to saving it, but here it's going to change to PSD, which is uh, which is good. So I'm going to save it, and let's see when we open uh, open Photoshop again. Hopefully it'll behave. Yeah, yeah. So oh, it just maximised in that funny way where you lose the title bar and everything, and also it doesn't fit in the red border for the recording. But there we go. Now it's back. Don't know why that does it. Yeah. So uh, that's much better. Okay. So I'll go back. There we go. And we're back to normal. Um, and I better just turn that timeline off. That's for, for later. I'm going to share that in a minute. So here we are. So uh, so now I've got the line work layer. I'll choose layer underneath, layer three. Well, let's go to layer two. That's the one at the bottom. And then again, coming back to the selection tools. I'm sure you've all tried the magic wand, but Make sure you know about the polygonal lasso because that's the one most professional people use the most. And so zooming in there, I'm just going to select fairly roughly, because I can, around the edges of the wall there. I'm not even being very precise. I can go under the walls because that black is going to cover uh, what I'm going to put in for my floor. So very roughly there. And I'll even go over the lobby. I'm just going to do the whole thing with the same floor material to start with, except uh, I won't do the bathrooms, they'll be different. Okay, so back to the beginning. All right, so I've got a selection, which uh, is much easier than trying to select in between all of those lines that I've got for the furniture and everything else. Uh, so then I'm going to fill it. I'll start off just with something very simple using the um, Paint bucket's always an interesting one. So with the paint bucket tool, you can set a colour. I'm sure you've all done that. You can easily set colours here, or you can use your colour picker and your swatches. Set a colour, of course, and it's good to spend some time working with um, colour models. Have I given you the spiel about primary colours? Which I think is fascinating, but I know at first you'll think, God, how can you go on for so long about primary colours? I'm just going to ask you then, what do you think the primary colours are? Yeah, <laughs> that's right, you know. Yeah, so, okay, so I know you'll think if you haven't been told... Yeah, yeah, look, I'll say it very quickly. Red, yellow, blue is what you're taught when you first learn about art. Um, they were thought of as the primaries about 150 years ago, but it's been worked out since then that that's just for pigment, and even then 
they're not quite at the accurate primaries, but they're okay. They all look great. You know, master painters use those for centuries. But if you really want to understand colour and why you have primaries in the first place, think about the way it works as light. And in that case, it's red, green and blue. And it's got nothing to do with red, yellow, blue. It's the opposite. Um, and, uh, well, the complementary, but we'll get into that. So when you work with colour in a computer program, it will always be red, green and blue. Also magenta yellow, they are the real primaries. But red, yellow and blue still will come back to that. It's got its place. And uh, so again, when you pick a colour swatch, you can see the red, green, blue values. Start to think about that. And you've got these, um, of course, preset colours that you can use to um, uh, make a start on your swatches. And of course, when you get a good colour, save it. Um, and it's a really um, big time saver because you can spend hours making brilliant colours and then um, uh, you want to make sure you can reuse those. Uh, so if you have trouble with the paint bucket tool, make sure you know about the options there for contiguous. Sometimes you might even have all layers on, they can cause some issues. But normally if you've got contiguous on and uh, also the tolerance can make a difference. But uh, again, just make sure those options are very similar to the um, uh, magic one, so make sure you're aware of those. So colour fills are fairly easy otherwise. Uh, if it just isn't working for you though, you can always go to the edit menu and choose fill. And then you get the option to choose either you know black or white or foreground colour. will give us the colour we've got here. And that will always work if the paint bucket, for some reason, with the settings there, isn't doing what you want. Um, and then you've got patterns. So I'm going to go and open up a texture file and show you a very simple way of making a pattern and then we'll go further into it. So if you look on the P drive in the um, material images folder, I've got a lot of textures that are used for rendering. So if we go to the wood folder there, and I'll just change the views here to large icons so that you can see those images. You can see we've got all these different <coughs> images, which of course are all wood, set up flat. So they're photographs, but they're taken obviously perfectly um, perpendicular, so it's uh, perfect for rendering. So I'll just uh, open up one of them. So to make that into a pattern that you can use for rendering, it's really easy in Photoshop, but a lot of people don't, don't know about this. On the edit menu, just go define pattern. That easy. And uh, you don't need to know much more than that at first. You can set the size and do all these things later when you get further into it. But for now, I'll just give it a name. Uh, chestnut uh, wood. So I know what it is. So that's now saved um, for use just on this computer. And so then an easy way of putting that into the selection is again on the edit menu, use that fill option. And then you can choose the pattern option there. And you'll see it will give you a choice of the patterns that are pre-made and there at the end is the one I've just made on this computer. So that's worked, but I didn't get much control over the size. And you can see it's much bigger than the lines I've drawn for my floorboards. So to adjust the size, there's a few options. So going back to there, there's nothing wrong with just doing it again. Edit and fill. You can tick the scripting option. And the brick fill, believe it or not, can be used to set the size. You've usually got to disable all the other settings. And if you go through this, it's interesting what you can do with it. Um, so the spacing, it's okay. The pattern scale, I'll come back to. But then the offset, I don't want that. So I'm going to set that to, um, to zero. Okay, we don't want any offset. The color randomness, I don't want that either. So I'm going to set that to zero. And you can see now they're getting more even. The brightness randomness, don't want that either. And now you can see they're finally all the same. And then we can look at the scale. So now I can change the size and make it smaller. Or go the other way and make it bigger. So that's one way of, ad of adjusting the size. It works, but you probably have a few goes at it to get it right. Um, 
But the good thing about that approach is that you also get the option to change the rotation if you want to, if you want to change the angle. Uh, so that's a good thing to know using that script option. But I'll show you another way, which is probably better using the blending option. So if we go to this layer, layer two, and then uh, I'll just right click there and then get blending options. You can do it with the um, button up here. I always forget which button it is. Uh, when you double click on it, it basically does the same thing. So I normally do it like that. But one of these buttons does it. If you double click on the swatch though, that's, that's the same. And you can do pattern overlay. So there I need to choose uh, that option and then I can choose the pattern that I've made from there. Right, and so that's generally a better option because you can just scale it on the fly. And you can see it straight away, changing scale. So that's how most people would probably do it. The only problem with this is that you don't get the option to change the rotation uh, in here. So if you know you've got to rotate it, either do it in the original file that the patterns come from or use that scripting option and you can rotate it. So a few different options, but yeah, the layer's a good one overall. So there we are. Um, so then I'll just get some of these um, furniture pieces and using the um, magic wand is, is not terrible. So for some things it makes sense. So I go back to my line work layer and then I can just start picking and it's getting everything because I've got contiguous turned off. So I'll turn that back on and then now I can just select inside some of my chairs, hold down shift and that will do an okay job if I just wanted to fill in. So that works. Um, and for the table as well, that would be okay. In fact, the table, maybe I don't want that, so I'll use Alt and deselect that area. And I'll do the table a different colour. So there, i would have a different layer. So we've got the flooring on the layer below, and then this layer will be for the rendering above that. And then that can be filled in uh, maybe just using the um, paint bucket tool and I'll get a colour for now. Uh, lounge chair. Uh, let's do beige. I hate beige, but let's just do it. Uh, and that works. It's not really beige, but that'll do. And then, um, so the end problem with that is if you want to do shadows from that layer, and that's what I'm going to show you next, um, sometimes the borders between the selection will get shadows uh, where you don't want them and then it might be better to do a polygonal selection uh, instead. But here I think it'll be okay. So with the, um, again, the blending options for the layer, you've got drop shadows. And that's a pretty good way of getting automatic shadows. So I'm just trying to move this so you can see them. I might just cancel it and... Um, oh, I've been doing the zooming and panning without telling you how. Um, in case you're not sure about that, the way I'm zooming with the wheel is just to hold down Alt and then it zooms just like uh, Revit does. And then if you let go of Alt, if you just use the scroll wheel normally, it, it scrolls up and down. And then if you hold down Control, it scrolls left and right. Control. So with Control left and right, without Control, without anything up and down, and then with Alt, in and out. So that lets you do pretty much all the um, zooming and panning you need to, just with those couple of option keys. So I'm positioning it so that it's uh, over to the side and then when I go and get that blending panel up again, uh, I'll turn on uh, drop shadows and we'll see them as I set them up. So I'll choose drop shadow, ticket of course, and then um, change the angle and the distance and you can see there really clearly the shadows uh, add a lot more depth. It's a pretty good option. And that's pretty much what you would have seen in some of the examples of finished rendered plans other people might have shown you. Um, the size is a density thing, so don't, um, don't worry when they disappear. When you make it bigger, that's all to do with the resolution. But you want those to be um, generally um, soft. So here you can see when you go low, that makes it more detailed, which is too accurate. And there you can see that's the problem I was talking about where we've got the borders between those shadows because of how I did my selection. 
But once you bring the size up enough and it's blurred, no one will know. So you do want generally to have nice soft shadows. The spread is related to that, but uh, you can see the effect as you adjust it. And uh, there we go. So then uh, the distance as well. Uh, that it's fairly obvious, you can see there the length of the shadows. And then at the angle again, you can see that as I adjusted it, so you can get down and get a different angle. Generally you want all your things to be the same angle. So decide an angle and then stick with it. And um, that's enough, so multiply is the default option and that's a good one. So that does work, and if you noticed there was a shadow coming up here, from the table. So remember this is a layer effect. So if I go back and select that, there must be a selection that's hard to see there but it is there. So I'm just going to select that area and then delete on the keyboard. That's your erase tool. Well that's one way of doing it. So that's cleared anything that got selected with the magic wand for that table and the shadow that was coming from that has gone with it. So that's one option for getting shadows, and you can see there straight away a lot more depth on those things. Um, maybe coming back to the floorboards, on my screen they actually look okay, but on the projector they look too saturated. There's no problem going back to that layer and then uh, making adjustments. And I'll show you two approaches there. You can use adjustments from the image menu, and try all of these out. They all do different good things. But brightness contrast is a fairly easy one to understand. You can make things brighter. And, uh, oh, but what have I done wrong? Exactly. Yep, spot on. That's, yeah, good to notice. Yeah. And you'll see it when you do this. So if you leave a selection, it only works in that area. So I'm going to go to the select menu and deselect, and then back to image and then adjustments. And we'll see straight away, you should see. Oh, it's because it's got a. Um, so it's a pattern overlay, so we've got to choose that. This is a bit different. So I'll show you the other approach. So the adjustments normally work fairly simply, but when you've got a, uh, a layer effect, you'll see that um, that won't work normally. So what's the other option? You use an adjustment layer. And that affects, generally affects everything underneath, but you can adjust that. So again, I'll go new adjustment layer, brightness contrast, and then now, you can see straight away the effect <coughs> of that change. And the really nice thing about adjustment layers is that they're a separate layer. So I'll bring this up so you can see it. Right, so they're a separate layer. You can turn that off if you want to go back to the original layer. You can just disable it or you can delete them. Uh, and you can always come back and tweak that setting. Uh, so. Yeah, so that's a different thing. Sorry, I want to get this one. So, yeah, I just double clicked on the wrong thing. So double clicking on the little icon there. Um, and we can then just adjust it further. The problem with adjustment layers most people have is that it works by default on all the layers below. So if I had other layers under that, it would work on all of them. Here it's not a problem, but maybe I'll put another adjustment layer above this one for the chairs. So um, again, layer, and uh, new adjustment layer, and I'll do um, a levels one this time. So I'll just make a change so you can see it. So there we are. So you can see there it's affecting the chairs and the floor. Sometimes you'll only want it to affect the layer below, so you've got this option here which I'm fairly sure is the one that makes it only affect the layer below. And uh, so you'll see then as I change the levels, only affects the chairs. Okay, so um, so those are the most, the most important techniques, but I'll show you one final little thing that I do a lot, particularly when I'm adjusting um, 3D renders. I'll just come back and quickly show you one of mine. So, where's, let's just go back to here. Okay, so you can see in these renders I've done that the shadows in the corners are nice and dark, 
which give a lot more definition and the real effect, it's called ambient occlusion, that effect, and it's, it's, a, it's a true thing that happens in the real world. But you often need to exaggerate it to get, um, you know, to get the effect you want in your renders. And I actually did a lot of that work in Photoshop just to beef those up. So, well, not so much for these, but I, I've done that before with a lot of others. So, um, so to do that, you can try and use drop shadows and things like that, and it's, it's often going to do uh, something close, but if you go in and make a layer just for shadows, so I'll make another new layer, and then it's kind of nice when you do them roughly, instead of using these automatic shadows, you can just use the brush tool. I'm going to set my colours here back to black and white, just using that little shortcut you've got there. So I've got my foreground colour as black, and then it's a good chance to look at the brush tool as well. So when you right click, you get the options for the size and the hardness, of course. So I don't want a very hard brush, but I also don't want a very soft brush, I want it in between. But play with that, maybe very quickly I'll show you if you haven't done this for a while. That's in between. So very hard, sorry, very soft we'll start with, so that's got much softer edges. And then if we take that all the way uh, to 100%, we get a fully hard edge brush. Uh, after a while, especially on your own computers, I'm sure you might look at uh, getting your own brushes in, which is a great thing for rendering. So I've got thousands of brushes that I've picked up over the years. Um, the watercolour brushes you can find, don't pay for them because the free watercolour brushes are sometimes better than the paid ones. And, um, and they're brilliant. You can do really beautiful rendering that looks like real watercolour uh, using Photoshop if you get the right brushes. But for now, I'll just focus on these round ones. And uh, so we've got the hardness, and then the size, of course, is the radius. But a nice shortcut there is the square brackets on your keyboard. So they'll make the brush bigger or smaller. So I'm going to get the hardness that I want, so fairly soft, and then on the fly I can simply use the um, use the square brackets to change the size. And then on this layer, I'm simply going to paint in shadows around the edge. And it's nice if they're a bit rough. If it's all too smooth and neat, it looks like it's been done by a computer. A bit of unevenness isn't a bad thing. So there's a bit rough, but I'll fix that. And I'll probably make it a little bit softer, but um, you'll get the idea in a minute. So just painting fairly quickly. I'll just do this wall so you can see it. Okay, that's a mistake, so I'll undo that. And actually, this gives me a chance as well. Has anyone had an issue with undoing in Photoshop? Yeah, it's awful. Yeah, yeah. That's once you know, and, and you would have known and worked it out probably once you see it. When you undo, it undoes the last step. I'm just doing Control Z, and then I'll do Control Z again. It doesn't go back further. It redoes that step, so it undoes the undo, which is super confusing. No other program is like this. Even Adobe programs are generally not like this. It's only Photoshop. When you go to the Edit menu, though, it can be a lot clearer. So undo, that's what I did, and then back here it tells you it's redo, but I want to keep going back. So what do you do? Instead of undo, you go step backwards. And then again, undo, step backward, and it will keep going back. Step forward, step forward, and it's like undo in other programs. And then the other one that's handy, on the window menu, bring up the history panel. And then you can see all your steps and choose how far you want to go back. And that makes life much easier. So it's just those little things. Yeah, Adobe is strange, but uh, it's the way it was. You know, Photoshop's a very old program. Yeah. Sometimes. I don't think it looks that great. No, yeah, I think it can take away from um, floor plans. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. You can. It's tricky in Photoshop because you'd have to work out the angle. So what I'd do is get it in Revit. So Revit will give you the angles, even if you're not going to use those shadows. So I might do that so I can show you quickly. So say you've got a view in Revit, 
and then you um, just turn on the shadows there and maybe I'd have it on even realistic and then turn the shadows on um, set it up for the angle and even there you know it's not worth fixing it but at least that's going to give us the angles I'd then bring this view into Photoshop and set up as an extra layer and it'll go in perfectly because it's all the same size and then just draw the shadows over the top I think it's easier if you want them Oh no, it would be so hard to work it out yeah, it manually in Photoshop. Yeah, I wouldn't bother. Yeah, that's where Revit's great. It'll help you because it'll, you know, once you set your sun settings, give you the perfect angle and, you know, let Revit do the hard stuff. Yeah. Oh, you can get it to show... You can, but it's, it's more steps than just drawing. Because once you've got this in, um, it's only going to be a few, you know, rectangles that you then put at an angle and copy the selection across. They don't be the same shape. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Because see, because here the, the, it's the oh, there's so many issues with the way it's giving you the shadow. I mean, they're solid, but at least you know the shape of it. You, know. you can make it, you know, give you the right shadows in Revit, but again, it's so much fiddling around. No. But yeah, I don't think it's a great thing to have shadows for the sun in a plan. Yeah, it looks ordinary. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's a graphical thing, and it, yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, you're not trying to show shadow diagrams or anything, but a bit of depth helps a lot. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah that's it. Just and and you know, I was hand chatting in the past, and that's where this is all coming from. So I always like to bring up some uh, real hand drawings as well because, uh, let's see, I'm sure these guys who are my heroes from the old days. Um, yeah, yeah, that's it. They're absolute freaks, these guys, because this is all hand drawing. But I'm sure you'll see it in here that they have uh, shading that's just done naturally as they're sketching. And... Uh, you know, so you can you know try and get the same sort of graphics with Photoshop. Um, these guys probably mostly align with Cashew, so maybe not the best example, but I thought they would have done it a bit. Um, here's another one. Oh, Studio, uh, Studio, Super Studio. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so these guys were, you know, again, from the old days, but uh, this is all hand-drawn and collage. But if you give you... Or collage, yeah. But yeah, this is from before computers. Yeah. Yeah. Cutting bits out of magazines and sticking them together. That's what we used to do. Yeah. You photocopy as your best friend when you're doing all that. Yeah. Yeah. Great techniques. I mean... See, what a lot of people are now doing with these graphics programs is trying to get the graphics that were, you know, happening before 3D and CAD and everything was around. Yeah. Yeah. So there we are. So, yeah, so shading, you know, just to get a bit of depth. You're not trying to show perfect shadows, but, yeah, depth definitely helps. Um, yep, yeah, so, so the final thing with this layer, so at the moment, it's just a black layer. So what I wanted to show you there... If you change it first to multiply, just like that other shadow layer was, yeah, it's brilliant, yeah, because it brings the colours through from underneath. And then just play with the opacity in the fill to get it to be the softness you want. And see there, now it looks like a shadow. And if you think it's not making much of a difference, without, with. Yeah. It's just a subtle thing, but it, if you do it all over your drawings, it gives you so much depth. And... Uh, that's the technique. So when you go and have a look at Alex Hogreef's stuff, you'll see all through his drawings, he does that. Shadows everywhere. Not directional shadows, just ambient shadows. Painted in, usually, he would have probably painted most of that with the brush tool. But have a look at his, you know, his fully rendered plans. I'll see if we can find... Where's his site plans? Oh, here's one with just shadows. That's brilliant. So how do you think he does it? 
I've seen the videos, I know how he does this. Believe it or not, mostly SketchUp. He gets SketchUp line work and then renders over it in Photoshop quite often, or uses 3ds Max a bit, but then uh, also AutoCAD. And uh, not much Revit. I know he can use it, but um, as far from what I've seen, mostly SketchUp. But the trick is being able to present it up. And here's a brilliant one, that's just beautiful. Um, I've seen him do this one. That is a SketchUp model. It doesn't look like SketchUp because you know SketchUp won't create things like that, but the 3D modeling you can do there and then it's all about the shadowing. Yeah, that looks cool, yep. So hopefully that's enough to get you going with the rendering of your particularly plans, but sections would be the same idea and you can apply this to any sort of view, even perspectives. Um, and. Uh, so that should be enough, hopefully, but let me know if there's anything else you can think of with Photoshop, but yeah, probably a good time to try some of those things if you haven't.